Welcome back to the Dealmakers Podcast Show with serial entrepreneur Alejandro Cremades, best-selling author of The Art of Startup Fundraising and co-founder at Panthera Advisors. In this podcast, we ask our guests about their successful acquisitions and financing rounds. Hey guys, so just a quick overview here on Panthera Advisors as I think it might be of value to you. So Panthera Advisors exist in order to help founders that are in the process of raising capital or get their company acquired. I actually started the company out of incredible frustration because during my entrepreneurial journey, which involved building, financing, scaling, and exiting companies, I could not find a resource that was founder friendly and I could not get the type of support that I was seeking. So as a result, I made a ton of mistakes along the way. So if you're looking to raise capital or you are looking to get your company acquired or just need some sound financial planning and you're looking to get the best possible outcome in the shortest period of time, feel free to learn more by visiting us at PantheraAdvisors.com or just reach out directly and shoot me a note at Alejandro at PantheraAdvisors.com. All righty. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Deal Maker Show. So super excited about the a guest that we have today, obviously a guest that uh, has been there, has done it, you know, has been everywhere around the world. I mean, it's really remarkable, his journey. Uh, and I think that the story that he has to share with us today is going to be super inspiring uh, for me, for you, you know, that you're watching, listening, uh, and I can't wait, you know, and I don't want to make you guys wait any longer. So without further ado, let's welcome our guest today, Eugene Danielkis. Welcome to the show. Thanks very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So originally born in Ukraine, but obviously, you know, time in Ukraine for you and for the family didn't last long. So tell us how was life growing up? Yeah, so I was born in Ukraine. It was still part of the Soviet Union. Uh, and my parents decided to leave when I was just about seven years old. It was a bit weird. We were learning English. I had no idea why we were starting to learn English because I was still learning to speak basic Russian. And then we decided, right, we're leaving. Took a train out and uh, I lived in Italy for six months before then flying over to Canada. and. Uh, I ended up, uh, yeah, moving to Canada. And then I understood why I was learning English because now I'm surrounded by a bunch of kids and uh, trying to keep up with them in, in terms of picking up a new language and everything. And um, grew up then and spent most of pretty much my my early days and until I uh, growing up in Vancouver. So then let's talk about Vancouver. I mean, how was that? Because you went there at what age? You were like about seven years old or, or how yeah, old Yeah, I was seven you? years old when I moved there, yeah. Was it like, like a big uh, culture shock for you and for the family? I think the yeah the language and the culture was quite difficult, right? I mean, life is always kind of difficult to, as a kid, of course, but I think especially when you're just trying to pick up a language, you have this really strong accent, you don't understand what all the other kids are saying, what the teachers are saying. So I think that made everything kind of a little bit more challenging, of course, uh, but also kind of really motivated me to, to learn really quickly. I was trying to pick up a language as much as I could, really highly motivated, but also I think made me kind of more... Yeah, motivated to learn, I would say, right? Because I'm kind of self-motivated because I, I saw the benefit of learning things and learning things quickly just to kind of fit in and be able to uh, to, to survive, really. Would you say that uh, for you seeing your parents as well going through the change and, and building a new life, you know, there in, in Canada perhaps inspired you, you know, in, in the direction of perhaps, you know, being an entrepreneur and, and being okay with, with dealing with uncertainty? I mean, was that something that perhaps shaped you know that entrepreneurial bug a little bit for you i think so i think it made me more willing to to take some uh, to take some risks and know uh you know i know the the big risks that my parents took and uh, in moving over and how challenging it was for them and you know even as an entrepreneur we talk about you know taking risks as an entrepreneur but even then i know that the risks i was taking were really nothing and the downside and the worst case of me failing as an entrepreneur were still going to be trivial compared to the risks that my parents were taking. So I think that always gave me a bit of a different perspective on risks because I know what I knew what really difficult was like. And I knew that actually pretty much given almost the luxury that I had of, of growing up in Canada, that my worst case was no, not going to be anywhere as challenging as my parents' situation. So I think that gave me a lot of perspective on that. And why do you think that a lot of people that are originally from Ukraine or, or I mean, that technical side, I mean, uh, that engineering mindset, I mean, what, why, why is that the case? 
it's a big part of the education there. And it's just a really big focus on that. It's a huge discipline. I mean, my dad was continuously proud of, you know, his engineering background, his uh, strength in math. He was always really pushing me and encouraging me to to be really strong in those disciplines because they're always really considered really important disciplines for everyone who's growing up, I think, in the Soviet Union. Um, and so I think that just gets passed along. And so it kind of falls out all these, you know, engineering, computer science, mathematics, that sort of elements were really important. And I think, you know, when, when you grow up in that, then you sort of uh, pass it on to your kids and it becomes kind of important part of the education. And you ended up sort of thriving in that. I always was really good in, in math. I was always, I was good at computer science. And I think that's just because I don't think I was particularly smarter. I think just because my parents were really encouraging me and, and supporting me in that and helping me kind of go above beyond. And that, that gave me like also a level of confidence because I could just see like, wow, I'm really good at this, but I was good at it because I had support of others who saw the importance in that. Got it. And in your case, I mean, that definitely uh, got you into computer science. You went to 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 college there in, in Canada. And uh, essentially all of a sudden you see yourself writing software that is going to be used in space. So how cool is that? Yeah, that was uh, that was really cool. I uh, So I, I was obviously a big uh, science fiction fan, reading lots of, lots of Isaac Asimov, watching Star Trek, that kind of stuff, as most people who do computer science are. Uh, and then I finished my studies and I applied for a couple of jobs. One was like some database job at a, a supermarket chain, which I didn't get. And the other one was working for a company that does software development for satellites and for NASA through the Canadian Space Agency. And that was a job I did get. Uh, so really happy that the other one rejected me because otherwise there's a different alternative universe where I'm working in a supermarket focusing on databases. So thankfully didn't get that job. Yeah. And why why did you decide to go and do your master's? I mean, what, what was that trigger for you? Yeah, so... I mean, I was. I think it was a matter of passion. I was so passionate about actually my first job and my first uh, project, the one that I was got to work on uh, on software that was up in space. And when I went into kind of maintenance, I just didn't see anything, any other projects that kind of excited me as much as that. So I was almost kind of spoiled with that. And so I kind of wanted to relight that spark in a sense. So I, so I kind of thought that maybe a little bit of a fresh start of doing a master's would be an opportunity to do so. But I think there was a second part, which was the fact that I wanted to do the master's in the U.S., in Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh. And I think I also wanted to really kind of, it was a bit of that start of the entrepreneurial journey of kind of venturing out on my own in a sense of like, I grew up in Vancouver, I went to school there, you know, my, my parents were always nearby. And, you know, moving to the U.S. was this really big thing for me because I'm like, I'm really going to be on my own. I'm going to start kind of from scratch in a way. Uh, kind of build up a new social circle, see where my career takes me from there. So I think it was a little bit of that kind of entrepreneurial, I want to try to build something uh, sort of from scratch for myself, combined with hopefully finding something that I was really passionate about as well. I mean, obviously, uh, that was the beginning of a lot of moving because, uh, you know, after that, it was Portugal, then it was uh, Germany, Amsterdam, so so you name it. So I guess, um, uh, obviously, the Masters was... Uh, what catapulted you to to end up to being in in Portugal doing certain projects, and eventually this is what got you into incubating the idea of of your baby of your of your company. No, so so what was that process like? Uh, and and what were you doing first and foremost in Portugal? And then how did the idea of really bringing you know this company to life? How did that come about? Yeah, so the the way that it worked over there was, so I started the master's in, in Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh, and there was an opportunity to go spend a part of the program in Portugal, because they were effectively taking the curriculum and copying it over to Portugal. So again, you know, the, the excitement of going somewhere new, exploring a new land, living in a beautiful country, I couldn't say no to that. So I took the opportunity, of course. And in some sense, it was a bit lucky because the program was set up that we were focusing half our time on like a capstone project. And our corporate sponsor for a capstone project was in the banking software space. You know, already this time up, me and uh, my eventual co-founder were kind of looking for something that we could take as an entrepreneurial venture because we had that kind of itch. And then once we started to get into this project and started to understand the world of finance, understand the world of banking, understand the role of technology in that, we got really excited about that. And we saw a great opportunity of the technology side. We saw the opportunity of, of the impact. And it felt like one of those things that is a is a mega trend and a mega wave that you know we had a chance to kind of ride on. Uh, 
And so as we got into it, we said this is this is something that uh, that we can get really excited on that we want to try to to build effectively. Very cool. So then, what was the triggering point that really pushed you guys over the edge and and where you really got okay, you know, like we really got to do this and Mambo is going to become a reality. The big journey, the big step actually was the, that really enabled it. I think was actually for myself was the decision to go do the masters because that was the tougher one because that was the decision of okay, I'm not, I'm quitting my job, I'm getting rid of all my furniture, I'm leaving my friends, I'm leaving my salary, etc., and I'm taking two suitcases and going to the U.S. So that's the kind of the okay, I'm going to go start on a new adventure. From there, the adventure of instead of I'm going to go get an, a job somewhere uh, using my master's degree of, you know what, I'm actually going to go try to see if I can create a business and uh, uh, out of this. That was sort of the easier step at that point, because I'm, I'm there with two suitcases. I know that my fallback is I can find some great jobs out of this. I have a, you know, a good degree and, and, a, and a good education and everything. So uh, I don't really see too much of a downside in some sense. So it, you know, it felt like a, an adventure of something to explore. In the worst case, I waste some of my time, but I figured I would learn so much anyway. And so it felt like really there's just all upside, basically, in some sense. Um, so it was slightly of a, a bit of a naive uh, view on it. But it was also, like I said, made easier by the fact that I've already, I guess, abandoned my safe job. I already left my apartment and everything else. I made the decision to, you know what, let's go pursue this venture. Let's see if we can make it happen. Let's see if we can build uh, a business. And I made it a, a relatively easy move, actually, at that point. So what were what were some of the early days like of Mambu? Yeah, so the first year was uh, just uh, figuring out a little bit of what we really wanted to build because we had the concept in our head, uh, but then we started to really get into the nitty gritty of building, designing the what the technology would look like, thinking a little bit about what the possible markets would be, and we we you know we were fully in it, but we also needed to pay the bills. We need to pay rent. So I spent half that year also working, you know, doing some consultancy work, doing some other software development. And the big thing for that year was, well, our, can we raise some funds? Can someone else believe in in this for us to make a real business out of it? Because we can only take it so far with just the two of us. Uh, and so we started to build the product. We built the first uh, prototype. And once at the end of that year, we got an angel investor to support us. That's that was really the big kind of wow moment because then it became it all very became very real, right? Because if we couldn't make it happen, then I'd have to find something else. But at that point, we have we have some money. We have an angel investor that believes in us. We have a prototype. We know that we can launch a, a product an MVP within the next you know six nine months. And now this is becoming real. It's becoming business. We're going to be hiring people and everything. Uh, and so that was really the first year of you know it's, it was kind of exploratory in some sense for that first year. And at the end of that year, it became very real, basically. Got it. It obviously took a little bit of time because you guys were bootstrapping this and, and doing some consulting jobs at the beginning in order to obviously pay the bills. But in this case, just so that, you know, we end up, you know, like the, the people that are listening get a good sense of, of what ended up a Mambu and, and what is the business model. I mean, what's the business model of Mambu so that people get it? Yeah, so it's a software as a service uh, platform for banking. The best way to think of it, if you're not from the from the space, it's a little bit like what Salesforce is to to CRM. So uh, Mambo is to the financial services space. So we're effectively kind of the back office system where banks, lenders, fintechs, and others use our platform to design and service how their products work. So if you think about designing, I don't know, a, a loan for a small business, how, you know, how the how the loan should behave, what are going to be the repayment terms, keeping track of the transactions, interest, accounting, all the other backend parts of how uh, financial products behave, provided in a software as a service way, uh, and then enabling our customers to use the whole entire ecosystem of fintech and build great technology customer experiences and build great products and technology on top of it is fundamentally our proposition. Got it. So then what was that uh, process like juggling? I mean, juggling the consulting jobs with really, you know, like pushing the business forward. I mean, was that uh, painful? No, not really. For the first uh, for the first year or so, it was okay because there was pretty much no expectations except our own, right? We didn't have customers. We didn't have investors. It's just a matter yeah. of how much time can we dedicate or uh, how little time could we dedicate another project so we can spend all of our time building Mambo, basically. So it wasn't that challenging. And because we were able to 
make enough money out of that and then get some uh, angel investment pretty early on, we were able to really focus on Mambu relatively quickly, I would say, within within that first year and really make it our full-time focus of, and attention. And you guys launched in 2011, but uh, things really took a turning point in 2015. So what happened there? Yeah, so we got to our first product pretty quickly, I would say. It was probably about a year or so from when we kind of laid down the first line of code to when we had our first customer live on the product and platform, uh, which is not so trivial because it's, you know, it's a banking product. It's relatively sophisticated. It's kind of mission critical system. So even though the capabilities were pretty small, it was still quite a bit of an MB, uh, MVP build. But we were a really small team. I mean, myself and my co-founders were focusing on building the product and technology, doing everything with our customers. We were we had a small team of engineers supporting us, but it was very, very hands-on the first few years. And our customers were finding us mostly organically. We didn't have much going on in the way of sales and marketing, but they were kind of finding us online through word of mouth. Um, but what happened was a lot of our customers at that time tended to be smaller organizations. They tended to be in emerging markets. Uh, there were some nonprofits and microfinance organizations, which was great as early customers and adopters. And we felt like we were making a really strong and positive impact and developing the product quite a bit during that time. But at the same time, it didn't have the kind of commercial traction that we would saw that would be able to make us to you know, create a sustainable business. Uh, never mind execute the vision for the product that we had because there's so many things that we wanted to build, but you know we didn't have the funds to do so. Uh, there's also quite a bit to support in terms of just the costs of running the business. So it was great to see the really rapid adoption by a lot of small organizations. So that was really exciting and stimulating and they had really positive feedback. And so it was always kind of encouraging to keep going. And as a, as a, as a product person, I always had great feedback and great ideas. But it was always a bit of a challenge on the commercial side of it to see, you know, they, they love the product, love what we're doing, but is this enough to make a real meaningful business uh, out of it? And that started to probably change around 2014 or so, 2015. Got it. And, and obviously, you know, from 2011, when you launched up until 2015, there was, I mean, you were in the desert. I mean, you were... Uh, considering early acquisitions, you know, obviously you were not happy with, uh, you know, where you were at, you know, at that point. So what, what would you say kept you going? I think it was, it was, the, it was the customers in, in some sense, because we just always kept getting really positive feedback from, from customers, even if they didn't have the ability to, to pay. We always had more and more customers contacting us. Uh, they, they were happy with the product and technology uh, it always felt like there was enough momentum behind that and we could always see sort of more and more things that we could do. So I think that's the part that kind of kept us kept us going, even though the, the commercially it was, it was a challenge in the first few years. We could just feel like we're on the right track. It just needs to, we just need to sort of survive and get through long enough for it to really break through because the feedback is there. There's more and more positive feedback Everything is pointing in the direction that we are right. The question is, how long will it take? We didn't know if it's, you know, we talk about it, the turning points being around 2014, 15. But back then, what if it was another five years? What if this year would have been the turning point? Could we have, you know, survived and and uh, gone through another five years of, of the challenge in the early first five years, right? It was a bit of that kind of endurance endurance test, but we somehow could feel like the trends in the market and the customer feedback were, you know, encouraging us kind of as our fan base effectively to to keep going. Yeah, because I think that when you're in the desert, you know, and and experiencing those types of uh, challenges, I think that also it impacts the culture to a certain degree, no? So so how how did you guys manage to really keep it together? I think we as a team, we just loved working together as well. So you know what, even though it's if you like the people that you're working with and you're supportive of each other, then uh, it makes the journey kind of endurable and sort of enjoyable in the sense of because you're going through the same challenges together, you're forming close camaraderies, you're figuring out things as a team. And, and I think that element of the fact that we liked each other, we liked getting along together, we like spending time together uh, outside of the office. The, that really helped, I think, because we just felt like, you know, we didn't want to let each other down. We were there to support each other. Uh, and I think that really helped a lot uh, in those days. And it wasn't just for like the close uh, founding team as well. For some point, we, I think it was about, 
of four months or so where we had to ask, we as the founders pretty much stopped taking salary altogether for about six months or so. And then we asked the, pretty much the whole entire company to take, I think, a 50% or so roughly salary cut for quite a while as we were closing a, a bridge fund, fundraising round. And there was almost no hesitation from everyone in the company. I think it was probably about 25 people or so to, to sign up for that. Uh, nobody quit. Everyone perf- said perfectly was fine to take the, the cut for a while, even though they didn't know if they would ever see the money at, at the end of it or if we would survive. And I think that kind of, again, m- not letting each other down and that camaraderie as, as a team, I think also really encouraged us and motivated us during uh, during those early years. Because uh, also, how, how much capital have you guys raised today, Eugene? Uh, today we've raised uh, over 150 million euros. Over 150 million euros, and how has it been the the fundraising journey? I mean, I'm sure that it has gotten a little bit easier, especially after 2015. But how has it been that that progression, and and also the expectations that you've that you've come across as as you were going out there and doing the roadshow? Yeah, so I mean, in the very beginning, the very very early fundraising was basically finding you know an angel investor or early companies that believed in us as a team and believed in the larger market trends. It was pretty much just a bet on that's where they think the market's going to go and they, they believe on us as a team to be able to execute and figure things out along the way. It wasn't really much more than that. Of course, we prepared lots of business plans and projections, but looking back, it was just simply a bet on those two things. Um, so it's good that they were, you know, that we were able to kind of get the confidence of the early investors because that's pretty much uh, all, all they were betting on was basically was us and the potential of a market. And then during, you know, once we started to get initial customer traction and feedback, then it started to change. Then it was really a question of how big of a market are you really addressing and how exciting is it? So in the early years, when it was just lending companies, people were trying to, you know, we kept talking about the bigger market opportunity in banking, et cetera. And we believed that that would still change. But all we had as customers and proof points was a much smaller market of a certain type of lenders. So the challenge was, you know, you have enough proof points, there's enough happy customers, but now it's investors betting on the fact that the market is much bigger than the market that we've so far managed to serve effectively. And I think that was pretty common uh, with a bigger and bigger market over time as we started to work with different types of organizations, more products that started to evolve. Um, but that was continuing kind of the story up until, you know, the most recent fundraising rounds where it's really becoming now a question of, how quickly can you capture the market? Because everyone now really sees what the really big market opportunities are. They can see how banks are thinking about cloud and how it becomes so strategically important. Now it becomes a matter of, okay, now we really see what the what the size of the prize is uh, and how far along you are on the track. The question becomes now a question of execution and focus and prioritization to capture the biggest part of that uh, prize uh, as possible. And uh, obviously, as you were progressing, you know, raising more money, growing the business, I'm sure that your role as well as the co-founder and CEO has has transformed and and evolved and also progressed. So, so how has it been, you know, like going through all these different phases uh, within the life cycle of the and the journey of the business, you know, for you as the as the CEO of the company? How has that changed? Yeah, it changes drastically every single year. And you know, if I was looking back and kind of telling, you know, giving some advice to my former self, I would probably ask myself to like, you know, as I start every year to like write, you know, write down my own job profile and like discuss that with my (laughs) co-founders or with my board or with someone else. Like, what is my job for this year? I think that's actually a really beneficial exercise to do, which I never did. And you kind of carry some assumptions about it because you just kind of grow into it year by year. But I think because the nature of the role changes so much and the the nature of the team and the company, it's actually a worthwhile exercise. And I think would have helped me to uh, be more clear on what I should focus on and get that kind of alignment between myself and the board and myself to get my own kind of confidence. Like, all right, these are the three, four most important things I need to focus on. The rest of it, you know, I need to manage, of course, because there's still business as usual and stuff comes up. But this is what I really, really need to focus on. And I think if I did that in the past, especially in the early years when things changed so much, that would have probably given me myself a bit more clarity because I felt like every year I was both figuring out the business, but also figuring out myself, like, am I doing a good job? And that's hard to say because I need to define what my job is to know if I'm doing a good job in that first. 
So there's probably a lot of people that are watching and listening and, um, you know, wondering board, for example, um, dynamics and, and things like that. And, and I guess, you know, in your case and to what you were saying on, on alignment with the board, uh, what, what does it look like when there's, there's full alignment, you know, between the management team and the, and the board of directors of the company? Well, for us, uh, up until so far, I've had a, my relationship with the board has been very much uh, an advisory nature in the sense of, you know, it's, it's, it's almost a, a sparring partner to myself. I feel like I have multiple advisors that I come to, and it's very much uh, up to me to present, you know, what are the topics on my mind? What are the challenges? What are our plans? Gather feedback for that. Some of it mostly, uh, some of it constructive feedback, some of it more of a, of a sounding board. So I think my relationship has been very much with the board of, you know, working with them as an advisory board, actually, for, for the most part. I think what's been beneficial has been actually laying out, the, you know, the really key objectives with the board for the year and for myself to actually, like I said before, to be able to clearly say this is what I want us to achieve as a business for the next couple of years. And, and to achieve that, these are the most important things for this year that, it should be, that we should be focusing on, which also means there's a few other things that we might not be focusing on so importantly. And some of those are almost implicit in startup because, for instance, a lot of startups don't focus on profitability. That's kind of obviously very implicit and everyone kind of takes it for granted. But it actually is beneficial if you make a lot of those implicit things explicit, as in growth is our number one priority. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean growth at any cost? Well, maybe not completely. Maybe you, there's a certain um, threshold where you're not comfortable spending that amount of cash to achieve that amount of growth. So I think this defining a lot of those things with the board also makes it uh, a, a lot easier in some sense as a CEO to execute because you know what to focus on and what not to focus on, uh, but also allows you to work with them better as, as advisors along that journey. And imagine, Eugene, that that you go to sleep tonight and you wake up in a world where the mission of Mambu is fully realized. What does that world look like? Uh, whew, good question. Um, I think uh, quite a few different things. I mean, we know when we set out basically to to build Mambu, we, we were in a world where there was about two and a half billion people that didn't have access to banking products and banking services. And, you know, we saw that as an exciting market, but in general, we thought, well, the whole generation of how people experience financial products, financial services is going to be drastically different over the next couple of decades. It's going to be obviously much more digital. It's going to be much more personalized. It's going to be uh, much more seamless and easy to, to experience. And uh, in a world where I don't think our vision is ever completely realized because we want to be fundamentally enabling our customers to create better banking products and services, and that will always change because the, what is better banking today will be different in five years and different in 10 years. And so uh, I want to make sure that our customers are still seeing us, you know, in 10 years or 20 years, even when we have billions of end customers serviced through our customers on the platform, our customers are still feeling like we're a partner that helps them to rapidly evolve with whatever is actually changing out in the world. Because the only thing that we know in all of technology trends is that the pace of change is is accelerating. And I think only right now are financial services companies starting to feel that. And uh, we want to be help make sure they're able to keep up with that pace of change. I love it. I love it. So so you were alluding to this earlier, you know, that you could you could have if you could have a chat with your younger self because it's typically funny enough you know, one of the questions that I always ask is what would you tell your younger self if you could go back in time? So you actually answer that, which is great. So, so I guess expanding a little bit more into that, you know, and, and if you had the opportunity of, of having a chat with, with your younger self, maybe that Eugene, that, that was thinking about, you know, starting the business. I mean, you were alluding to it that you would kind of like give yourself a little more guidance uh, and, and to showcase what needs to be done because every year is changing. So if you had, for example, that opportunity of, telling yourself what you would have done from C to Series A and then from Series A to Series B and Series B and beyond, what would you tell yourself in order to really be effective as the co-founder and CEO of Mambu? I think I would say just to be a bit more honest with, my, with myself in terms, in, in terms of what we're trying to achieve. So that C to Series A, especially in our space where we're building you know, an enterprise, vertical, mission-critical software platform, we sort of presented ourselves to, to customers and to investors as a 
I won't say a, a finished product, but a, a complete product, right? And I think we would have been more beneficial if we kind of went into it in the early years and, and said, you know, to the market and to our investors of, you know, for the next three years, we're going to co-build our platform and product with our customers. We're not going to let them build it for us, but they're not going to define the features and everything. We're going to still stick to our product vision and our, you know, SaaS principles, but we're going to go find customers that are forward thinking, that want to co-develop with us. Uh, yes, they'll pay us some amount of money for that service, but we're not focusing on, you know, on revenue growth. We're focusing on customers that believe on the vision that will help us co-develop the platform. Because that was that's what we ended up really doing the first three years. But we did that sort of implicitly. And as a result, we were, you know, really focused on, you know, our revenue growth and other factors. But those, in retrospect, weren't really important. It really didn't matter if we were growing 200 or 400 percent or 75 percent year on year for the first three years. All that mattered was how strong of a product and platform we're building and how closely aligned was it to our uh, our target customer segments and personas. And so I think we sort of maybe sort of fell into I don't know if it was in the trap or just the nature of feeling like, well, we need to you know, show revenue growth, we need to show uh, velocity to investors and all that. But actually, if we were honest about what we really need to achieve, we would have probably faced it differently. Maybe we would have found different investors or maybe the same investors. Um, maybe we would have found different customers. I think that would have been more honest of what our real objectives during that midterm would have been. And we might have then changed a little bit of our, our approach as well. And, and that comes back to, like I said, defining a little bit of, you know, what is the sort of the strategy, but what is really the key objectives within that time? And I didn't really define that. In the beginning, you know, I sort of thought, okay, well, we're the CEO, we're building a startup, we have to show revenue growth. All these startups on FinTech or in TechCrunch and everywhere else are talking about their 200, 300% AR growth year on year. We need to be a company like that. So it was almost kind of the sort of the default path. If I stood, stood back and stepped I step back a little bit and thought what's actually the right thing for us strategically, it probably wouldn't have been that. It would have been a slightly different path, but I didn't know that at the time. Got it. Very, very profound, Eugene. So for the people that are listening, what is the best way for them to reach out and say hi? The best way to reach out to me is just, uh, you can always find me on LinkedIn uh, under Eugene Danilkis, and then just send me a message on there. Amazing. Well, Eugene, thank you so much for being on the Dealmaker Show today. It was a pleasure. Great questions. It was a pleasure to chat. If you like the show, make sure that you hit that subscribe button. If you could leave a review as well, that would be fantastic. And if you got any value, either from this episode or from the show itself, share it with a friend. Perhaps they also appreciate it. So also remember that if you need any help, whether it is with your fundraising efforts or with selling your business, you can reach me at alejandro at pantheraadvisors.com. You've reached the end of another episode of the Dealmakers podcast. For free resources and materials, head over to alejandrocremades.com. Thank you for listening and see you at the next episode.